regional and national recognition for a number of community gardening projects she has designed and coordinated, including a therapeutic gardening program for young women working to overcome eating disorders and food growing projects addressing food insecurity and engaging marginalized community members. For this year, she is coordinating a new native plant and butterfly garden on the waterfront in Ambleside. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing a bit more of that at a later date, but today she's going to be talking about tomatoes. So um, Jane will speak and share her slides and then um, at the end she will answer questions. So if you do have questions, uh, please just pop them into the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Great. Okay. So thank you, Jane. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Yeah. Thanks for coming on such a beautiful day. It, it really is a day for gardeners, but I guess we can have a little break from that. <laughs> and oh, sit I'm delighted that we can all be together. We... Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's get going. So tomatoes have been grown as food crops since around the 1700 AD. They were grown by the Aztecs, but they weren't introduced until the UK and Europe until the late 1500s. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a croaky voice. Uh, then for 200 years after this, they were only really grown as an oddity. Uh, they were considered the devil's fruit, uh, principally because they were red and people thought that they turned men into werewolves if they ate them. Uh, even when the people started to consume them in the 1700s, uh, many people still believed that they were poisonous because uh, there was often lead in plates and the acid from the tomatoes caused the lead to leach out. And this actually did poison people. Uh, today, they're very popular. They're grown in 96% of all vegetable gardens and tomato breeders are reestablishing heirloom seed strains and crossing many of these to introduce tomatoes with a fascinating range of colors and flavors. Um, tomatoes grew, uh, grew in the wild and still grow in the wild in northern Peru and southern Ecuador. Uh, there are new genetic studies too that are suggesting that they may have co-evolved in Asia. Uh, there are 15 species of wild tomatoes, um, and these are all huge sprawling plants with tiny fruit, often just the size of a pea. Um, so we don't commonly grow these in home gardeners because, because of their size. Um, but if you want to grow them, you can get seed from Salt Spring Seeds. Uh, so we grew some in a school garden. <laughs> I'm really sorry about my croaky voice. Uh, the plants we grew in the school garden grew five by five. Um, so we pulled all of them out but one. Um, and it, the plant produced tiny sort of pinky nail sized fruit that fell on the ground and then the skin cracked when they fell. Uh, so the project was lots of fun, but um, we didn't get very many tomatoes to eat. Uh, when we dug the plant up at the end of the season, um, it had about a five by five foot root ball. Um, it was actually quite fascinating to see. So tomatoes have vigor in their genes and all their, and really almost all tomatoes, whether they're heirlooms or hybrids, they need room for the roots to grow. Um, if you're interested in growing a tomato that's close to its wild cousins, um, but produces delicious small fruit, uh, you can try Matt's wild cherry. Um, it's, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Oh no, oops. Um, I beg your pardon, sorry. Um, if you um, try Matt's Wild Cherry, um, it's a delicious tomato. Um, it's still a huge plant. Um, here is one that uh, Julie Kaler grows. And um, well, basically we'd laugh all summer because it's, I mean, it's really, it's as big as a Volkswagen. So tomato breeders, if you look at this picture, there's a picture of wild tomatoes up on the top left. Um, tomato breeders have moved from sort of wild tomatoes that had tiny fruit that weren't, didn't grow in clusters to fruit like Matt's wild cherries. Um, the cherries are bigger, there's more, and they're sort of in a cluster. And then, we see fruit like sweet million, sweet million, pardon me, 
Um, it's a very popular tomato. You get more than 20 tomatoes per truss. Uh, they ripen across time, which is great. And they're disease, res disease resistant and delicious. Um, so tomatoes for Vancouver. Um, the best tomatoes in Vancouver ripen in under 65 days and are late blight resistant. Um, our nurseries like Costco, Walmart, they often sell tomatoes plants um, that have been grown in California, but California has a very long growing season with much more heat than we have. So varieties that will grow well there are very difficult for us to grow. Uh, we have cool springs, and while our summers can be hot around the third week of August, we get cooler nights. We see dew on the grass, and these conditions foster late blight. It's a fungus-like disease that can stunt or kill tomatoes. So when we're growing tomatoes, we want them ripe by the beginning of August, so they're ahead of late blight and producing fruit, hopefully, and strong enough to stand up to late blight. Uh, most of these tomatoes that ripen in 65 days or less are cherry tomatoes or tomatoes that are under three inches in diameter. Um, I'm sorry, I went ahead before I should. Um, if you look at this diagram, um, you can see May is still quite cool. Um, if you plant tomatoes out in May, you need to keep them protected. Uh, an easy way to do this is to plant a seedling, put a tomato cage over it and wrap it in plastic like a dry cleaner bag. Um, typically gardeners plant out June 1st. Um, we we plant, plant transplants out. Then you have 30 growing days in June, 30 growing days in July. And so 50 day tomatoes are ripe at the end of July but an 80 day tomato won't be ready till the end of August. So um, it's when late blight strikes, uh, weather starts to cool down in September. Um, and September can be sunny, but it doesn't have the heat of the summer sun. Um, so we try and get all tomatoes ripe by, and starting to produce at the beginning of August. Um, if you look at plant tags, um, they'll tell you days to maturity. Um, the days to maturity refers to the number of days it takes for a plant to produce to make ripe tomatoes um, after it's been planted in the ground as a seedling. Uh, the tomatoes tags will also often tell you height, planting distance, and whether they're determinate or indeterminate. Um, when you're choosing to tomatoes to grow, you can choose between determinate and indeterminate types. And 30 years ago, this was used to be quite an important consideration because the indeterminates that were available then usually grew eight or 10 feet tall and they suckered madly. So it took a lot of work to remove those suckers. But today there are many indeterminate tomatoes that are manageable size and that sucker only really minimally. So the, the reason you consider whether you're gonna grow an indeterminate or determinant tomato today uh, really has to do with tomato production. The indeterminates produce fruit over an extended period of time. So something like Sun Gold, that's one of my favorites, starts to pr produce tomatoes at the beginning of August and then produces them all the way through to early, early November. Uh, whereas determinant types, um, that might ripen at the beginning of August. You'll have concentrated fruit, ripe fruit for about a three week period. Um, and your friends will love you if you uh, give them homegrown tomatoes. Um, it's important to choose plants with a size that suit your space. Um, I included just these lists of determinants and indeterminants, not to talk about them, but just to show there are lots and lots of indeterminate and determinate types that are at a manageable height. Um, it's, it's helpful when you grow tomatoes to grow more than one kind. Um, the weather is often variable here. Um, oh, I've lost a page of notes, I beg your pardon. Um, 
sorry, our weather is often quite variable these days. So um, if you're growing more than one kind, you may have one that does poorly, but you'll always have one that does well. Um, here are some proven tomatoes for our area. Uh, for as long as I've grown tomatoes, Early Girl and Celebrity have always been popular. They have about three inch sized fruit that are delicious. Uh, you commonly see these in nurseries too. Um, when you see the pots of tomatoes that are out in front of Fresh Market in late May and early June, um, these are generally Early Girl, Celebrity and Fantastic. Um, they're usually around $5.99 and they have their fruit on them. So well, I think they sell very well. Um, of note is going back to determinate and indeterminate. Fantastic and early girl are indeterminate. So if you buy them at the beginning of June when they already have fruit on them, they'll continue to produce fruit into the fall. Um, celebrity, though very popular, is determinate and you'll get almost all your fruit then right in the next three weeks and then a minimal amount of fruit after that. Um, other red tomatoes that we love, um, many of you have probably heard of Cherokee Purple. It's the, it's the best large heirloom tomato to grow here. And you can almost really sort of tell by looking at it that it will be juicy and flavorful. Uh, Mountain Magic, uh, I have a friend, Sandra, who's grown tomatoes for over 40 years. She's grown every kind and now she only grows Mountain Magic because she loves them. Uh, they're like a Campari tomato, like we can buy in the store, um, but they're better. Um, many of us love beefsteak tomatoes, but a traditional beefsteak are too big and take too long to grow here. So a really good alternative is Cosmonaut Boca. Um, it's beefsteak flavor, but it ripens here faster. Um, brandy wine is probably the heirloom tomato that people like the most and it wins, consistently wins taste competition. But it, again, it takes 90 days to ripen here, so it's too long, takes too long to ripen. So breeders took the pink brandy wine tomato and big dwarf tomato and crossed them to give them big brandy. Um, it's sort of a pinky, delicious tomato, and it will ripen here. Um, I always grow Roma tomatoes. Um, they, are, they are straight tomato flavor, but I, I really like them. Uh, I grow Amish paste. Um, Roma tomatoes, they're dense, less juicy, sort of straight tomato flavor. But they're really good for cooking because of that. On flatbread, you don't get sort of soggy flatbread or pizza. Um, people, people really like them to sun dry. I've never sun dried them before, but apparently they sun dry really easily well. Oh, pardon me, they grow sun dry really easily as well. Uh, Midnight Roma, I've mentioned this because um, as you start to grow tomatoes, sometimes it's exciting to look for new seeds and new seed sources. Uh, Midnight Roma um, is, the seeds are sold by row seven seeds. And I thought I'd mention them because um, they call themselves a collaboration of chefs and breeders dedicated to deliciousness. And they probably only sell about 15 kinds of seeds for vegetables. And they're all quite wonderful and all quite different. Uh, we can order seeds from around the world without any customs or import impediments. So it's fun to look at uh, other seed, seed companies that offer other things. Uh, most tomatoes need um, good soil, consistent amounts of water, but some of us don't have good soil in our gardens. And, uh, you know, we may travel or just not consistently water tomatoes. So two really great tomatoes that are flavorful and fabulous to grow are uh, Stupas and Mountain Magic. Mountain Magic is the one uh, my friend Sandra grows who grows nothing else. Uh, Stupas is a uh, tomato that grows well in cool weather um, that we often have in the spring like this year. Doesn't need soil that's as fertile and it needs much less water. It's grown by many, many, many sort of farm gate sales in the Fraser Valley and by CSA farms all over BC. Uh, Mountain Magic is the most disease resistant 
uh, tomato that we have. Um, it was more than 11 years in coming to a market bred the old fashioned way with strong plants that were resistant to blight. Seeds were safe from them, growing out again. Um, it was introduced in 2008. It was a real breakthrough in, um, for tomato growers because it has such strong blight resistance. Um, many gardeners in Vancouver only grow cherry tomatoes because they ripen in 42 to 65 days. Uh, Gardener's Delight is um, the most popular heirloom cherry tomatoes growing. Um, I don't personally like it. I find it thick skinned, but lots of people love it. Um, I grow Sun Gold. I think if I only grew two tomatoes, that would be one of them. Um, it's a fabulous sweet tomato with what they say is tropical fruit flavor. Um, it's an indeterminate, so it grows um, starts to produce fruit at the end of July um, and will produce fruit all the way through till November. Uh, lots of tomatoes in sort of September, October, November decline in flavor because we don't have the intensity of the sun that we do in the summer. But sun gold has sweetness in its genes and it keeps on producing beautiful, fruit, beautiful sweet fruit. Uh, sweet Million has been around for as long as I've grown tomatoes so for certainly more than 40 years. Um, you can see looking at this plant, they have huge trusses of tomatoes uh, and they're delicious. <laughs> um, if you lack space, uh, say you, you just, uh, or perhaps you live in an apartment, um, there are tomatoes that you can grow quite easily. Tiny Tim is a little on the upper left side there, is a little 12 inch plant. Um, you can grow them in just a one gallon pot, produce about maybe five or six cups of fruit over the summer. Um, down below, there's a picture. Uh, um, we grew tumbler trailing tomatoes in hanging baskets at the senior center. They can grow, you can grow them in a pot with sort of two or three gallons of soil or in a hanging basket. Uh, Big Dwarf is one of the one I mentioned before that was bred with pink brandywine. It's a two inch plant, but it produces six inch tomatoes around 55 days. So we can grow it here too. Um, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, can we grow heirloom tomatoes here? Uh, beginning gardeners don't, uh, but Heirloom tomatoes really have unmatched flavor. And um, so many of us really want to grow them. Um, if we want to grow them, we still need not, um, 80 or 90 days of hot summer sun to ripen them. So to grow them here, you need to buy mature transplants and put them in the ground at the beginning of June. Uh, most nurseries sell these and um, those small market garden stores that are out on Marine Way and Burnaby, uh, sort of like Mandeville's, um, out by Mandeville's Garden Center. Um, Wing Wong's is out there and they sell dozens of different types of heirloom tomatoes that you can get at the beginning of June. Um, often they already have their fruit then. So you get a three or four month old transplant to put in the garden. Um, so you can set them out in June. Um, it's helpful to grow them in hot areas of your garden against a wall, say, that holds and reflects heat or on concrete that holds heat. Um, the key to, key to growing them, though, really is to get them ripe by August so that they have, there's enough heat to develop full flavor. Um, I've grown brandywine and black kim, and they're really delicious when they ripen in August, but if they ripen in September, the flavor and the texture of the tomatoes really declines. Uh, these colorful stripy tomatoes are very popular these days. Um, the breeders who brought them to market have um, bred old heirlooms, um, often with wild tomatoes um, to get faster ripening tomatoes with staggering flavor. 
Uh, the tomato that started it all was green zebra. It was uh, bred by Tom Wagner in Washington in the mid eighties. And it's, as you can see, it's a yellow tomato with green stripes. Um, inside it has green flesh, but it's quite extraordinary because it has what's described as sweet lemon lime flavor. Um, it was popularized by, not surprisingly, a California restaurant and chef, uh, noted chef Alice Walker served it at Chez Panisse in Berkeley. And this really started a, a sort of boutique tomato breeding craze. Uh, this year, the two tomatoes that were, well, tomato seeds sold out instantly for Berkeley tie-dye and pink boar. Um, these are more of these stripy tomatoes that are juicy and flavorful. Uh, the breeders of these new tomatoes are also breeding strong plants um, that need less water and uh, fewer nutrients. So you get quite wonderful plants that are easy to grow. Um, black tomatoes are very famous. Uh, many of you have probably heard of indigo rose. It's described as having superb smoky flavors. Um, we've always had black and purple tomatoes. Many of them came from the Crimean region, um, but they were very large tomatoes as you can see in this picture. And they take a long time to mature, um, but they are very flavorful, juicy, and generally very high yielding tomatoes. Um, a lot of tomatoes we grow here were bred in Oregon and Washington because uh, the climate is similar to ours. And uh, Jim Myers is a breeder in Oregon. And he, he took some of these, two of these old Russian heirlooms and took two wild tomatoes from the Andes and crossed them to get indigo rose. Um, it's a very popular tomato and it grows very well here. Um, it is. So tomatoes in the past may have been described as rank and stinking, and not fit for hogs, but today we see the adjectives that really were just used for to describe wine before, but rich, smooth, and savory with earthy notes, rich, highly aromatic, burgundy wine. Um, the Black Beauty um, tomato that's shown here on the left um, is considered the most flavorable black purpley black tomato and um, people who are in tomato, into tomatoes are really into tomatoes and there are taste testing competitions and national taste testing competitions and tomato expos and tomato weeks, but the Black Beauty uh, tomato, uh, the tomato expo in Portland two years ago, apparently when the judges tasted them, one of them stood up and shouted, this is the best tomato I've ever eaten. And it's, uh, uh, apparently wonderful. Um, it's sort of hard to believe that the flavors of these tomatoes are distinctly different if you grow and only grocery or only eat in grocery store tomatoes. But um, when one of my friend daughters, one of our daughter's friends was over here, I gave him some gold tomatoes and he was absolutely speechless and his eyes went wide and he just sort of muttered, pineapple. Um, these tomatoes do have distinctly different tastes and they are certainly fun to grow. Uh, we can grow transplants from the nursery um, or we can expand the types of tomatoes we grow um, by ordering seeds online. Um, Salt Spring Seeds sells 80% of the tomatoes that I've mentioned in the talks. Um, they're a beautiful, lovely small farm. They grow all the seed they sell or they buy it from other local small farms like Two Wings Farms. Um, when you buy seeds from these local growers, um, the tomatoes you get will, or any vegetables you get will, are better suited to our gardens. They've been grown in the same gardening conditions and plants adapt to the environments they are in. So if you can buy locally grown seeds, it's always better. Uh, full circle seeds and soup. Uh, this is not conventional agriculture. Um, they don't overspray everything with herbicides to start to kill all the weeds. The weeds grow and attract beneficial insects. Uh, they don't use herbicides, pesticides, no synthetic fertilizers. Um, uh, going further afield, 
Um, Baker Creek seeds, um, you, you can tell they're, you're in for something interesting and different. Uh, their website is rareseeds.com. Um, they have fabulous seeds, many of the same seeds actually as salt spring seeds plus more. Um, they've been reintroducing seeds that have been found in uh, South American, Southeast Asian, African markets and have been found uh, in indigenous communities. Um, you can see looking at this, their, their webpage picture that sort of the trend in vegetables is colorful, colorful uh, phytochemical rich vegetables. Um, I have about a dozen more slides. Um, there was a lot of information online on growing tomatoes. So I've summarized some of the things that I think are most important. And um, so now we'll talk about uh, getting out into the garden to grow our tomatoes. Um, we plant our tomatoes outside in early June and in 60 days, they can put on four, five, six feet of growth and produce buckets of fruit. So they need nutrients in the soil. Um, I find it very hard to believe this was a 2021 ad showing a woman pouring synthetic fertilizer into her vegetable gardens to start growing. Uh, I, I prefer not to use synthetic fertilizers. Um, synthetic fertilizers are these bags, sort of a manufactured inorganic compounds like uh, ammonium nitrate, ammonium phosphate. Uh, they supply only three main nutrients, uh, NPK. They don't supply nutrients um, and they don't build healthy soil like organic amendments or organic fertilizers do. Um, they've been found to harm the bacteria and fungi in soil that help plants take up nutrients and that help fight off disease. Uh, they're highly soluble. The directions on the bags push us to use much more than we need and the excess is running off into streams and quite significantly upsetting ecosystems. Um, the synthetic fertilizers are unnecessary contrary to what um, a lot of the media and a lot of it's, <laughs> and the chemical companies say. Um, I prefer to provide nutrients for my vegetable garden and tomatoes using composted manures or compost. Um, if you top dress your garden beds with four inches of composted manure or good compost, you will have all the nutrients your tomatoes need. Um, the nutrients in organic fertilizers or in compost um, aren't available for plants to use until the soil is warm and the microorganisms have started to act on them to break them down into nutrients in a form that plants can use. So when you top dress your bed, it's best to do it in the beginning of April. So uh, the soil will warm up and the nutrients will become available. Um, four inches of compost um, will supply all, all the major nutrients you need, NPK as well as calcium, magnesium, and uh, sulfur that the plants need for optimum growth. It's, um, it's a very big job to bring in four inches of soil amendments to a garden every year. Um, so lots of gardeners will sort of, they might bring in two inches of top, they might trust, top dress their garden beds with two inches of organic amendments, and then they might use an organic fertilizer. And then they'll usually, often they'll mulch just the sort of chopped greens or yard waste. So you're using sort of the three of them to supply fertilizer or nutrients that your plants need. Um, I vary the kinds of soil amendments that I use, um, sort of be between mushroom manure and the transfer station composted green waste or like composted pig or composted steer manure. Um, I, I do this to sort of balance out the micronutrients that will be available in the soil. Uh, once you've prepared your beds, you can transplant your transplants. Um, there are three pictures of three transplants here that are different size. On the left, um, don't buy the little 49 cent transplants. Um, 
they take an extra two or three weeks to get to producing and we want tomatoes early. It's pushing it even to try and get them at the beginning of August. So it's better to buy the plants that are shown in the middle picture here. They do cost more, but they will produce buckets of tomatoes. Um, you wanna choose the healthier, taller plants um, because as well, when you plant tomatoes, you bury the stem underground. So we, the more stem you can bury, the more roots you'll get, the more plant growth this will support. So it's worth buying these taller plants. Uh, you can buy tomatoes that already have fruit on them. And if you want to spend the money, it's great. You'll get tomatoes that um, are start to produce for you as soon as you plant them. Um, when you plant tomatoes, um, they're very unusual. Most plants, if you put the stems underground um, where they, they're exposed to moisture and bacteria, the stems will rot. The tomatoes, interestingly enough, will root all along the stems if you plant them underground. So the best way to plant them is to trench plant. Um, you take the, remove the lower leaves off the bottom of the tomato plant, lay the plant sideways, covered with soil, and at the end of the season, you'll, the picture on the right shows you get many more roots when you can do this and more roots means you can support stronger growth. Um, this, this picture makes me laugh, I don't know why, but I think it's, it's a picture of tomatoes lying on the ground waiting to be trench planted. Um, traditionally, we planted tomatoes all together in a row. Um, it, made it easy to water, it's easy for crop rotation. Um, but tomatoes actually self-pollinate. Um, they aren't like corn that needs to be grouped together to ensure pollination. Um, so we can interplant tomatoes in the garden. Uh, tomatoes actually aren't prone to any insect damage here. Uh, we don't have those orange, four inch tomato worms. Um, uh, but, um, uh, sorry, um, people like to interplant and plant uh, flowering plants in around their tomatoes because they'll attract uh, beneficial insects. Um, though they find that interplanting isn't necessary to help keep pest numbers low on tomatoes. Um, it's beneficial to other plants, it seems. The smelly leaves of the tomatoes seem to deter like the uh, like cabbage white moths from going to kale. Um, some people just think the smell sort of confuses insects, insect pests when they come into the garden. Uh, so interplanting, um, this is a garden bed that we planted at the senior center and um, we planted tumbler tomatoes in the corner of the bed and a teepee with peas in the middle and added chives and beans and parsley. So, you know, sort of the old idea about plant them all in a row isn't something we have to abide by. Um, when I always, when I plant vegetables, including tomatoes, I always sprinkle a package of seeds for alyssum. Um, that's the scented white low annual. It's, um, it covers the ground and so reduces moisture loss. It's like sort of a green mulch. Um, it stops weed seeds from germinating. Um, and it provides same beautiful scent and nectar for bees and butterflies. Um, after tomatoes are planted, most books recommend you mulch. Um, I find after I bring soil amendment in, I have done my one big project in the garden. It's another big project to bring mulch in. Um, mulching is valuable particularly for tomatoes because it stops soil from being spattered up onto the tomato leaves when it's watered. And that soil often has uh, fungal spores in it that can cause disease. Um, it's helpful to mulch because it slows moisture loss in soil. Um, it moderates soil temperature, prevents weed seed germination, and then ultimately it will break down to add organics to the soil. Um, I don't do this, though it's a very valuable practice, but instead I chop and drop mulch. Um, chop and drop is a practice where you just, anytime you trim off any kind of greenery in your garden, you just drop it on the ground. It's, um, 
this really does involve a big change in practice from this whole sort of notion of cleaning up and clean up your garden and putting bags of green waste out or clean up and put the green things into the compost. Um, it, and it involves a very significant change in aesthetics because um, most of us were sort of taught we clean up our garden beds, but we'll have a much healthier sort of overall ecosystem and healthier garden if we don't clean up. Um, we can leave fallen leaves at the end of the season. We can chop and drop, and um, you'll soon see that you'll see like little those little black ground beetles scurrying along in the litter, and they are the ones that eat slug eggs. Um, our ecosystem gardens are an interconnected ecosystem, and if you you know encourage and support insects and bugs, you also then get more birds in your garden. Uh, there are two plants gardeners have grown forever, uh, comfrey and borage. Um, you can use, these are great plants to grow, and you can just chop and drop those into your garden. Um, most leaves, including comfrey and borage, are sort of like two, one, two for their main nutrients. So they are a good mild fertilizer, and then they add organic materials to your soil. Um, it's interesting, old books on companion planting or old books that mention companion planting used to always recommend planting borage and comfrey with tomatoes. Um, watering, you want to keep water off tomato leaves when you water because they are prone to fungal diseases. Um, so drip irrigation really is the best way or hand watering with a wand is the best way to water tomatoes. It's, um, you want water to get down deep to the bottom of the roots. And sort of if you're a beginning gardener, it's helpful just to take a spade and dig down to see just how deep the water goes uh, to make sure it gets deep. You, it's better to water less frequently and deep than infrequently and shallow. Uh, you, how much water is, is a real challenge because soil, heat, wind, um, they all differ in gardens. So soil dries out at different rates. It dries out at different rates, of course, at different months. Um, it's when, when you grow tomatoes a lot, you actually start to notice the leaves of tomatoes grow, change color um, as they start to need water. Um, Sort of part of the joy of gardening really is slowing down to look and see what's going on in your garden and to observe changes like this and you'll soon realize oh, my tomatoes need water and you'll water accordingly. Uh, the picture on the right is a tomato that was growing on the beach uh, down on Evergreen Beach where my husband and I go for coffee. Uh, it's seeded in there somehow. It grew in sandy, gritty, awful soil. It grew without water. So um, a lot of people are realizing that tomatoes really don't need the water that traditionally we have suggested they receive. I mean, we don't, the, um, it's, tomatoes need steady, consistent water. Um, tomatoes that don't get enough water often get quite thick skinned, which I, I find most people find undesirable. But nonetheless, people are dry farming tomatoes. The early girl tomatoes that um, grow so well here, uh, they're being grown in, even in California where it's hot in dry farm conditions. Um, if, you, if you want to read about a really great uh, dry farming, dry farm, uh, Google dirty girl farm. Uh, they grow the they grow early girls and they talk a lot about how you do this. Um, I haven't done this, so I, I can only comment and repeat what I've read. I'm I'm gonna fiddle this year and see what I get. But uh, in dry farming, healthy soil is really critical, of course. Um, tomatoes are planted early, so roots go deep to get um, the sort of spring rainwater that's still in the soil. Uh, the soil health is key. You have, to, you have to maintain really healthy, organic, rich soil and mulch well. But then no supplementary water is added. Um, to me, this is 
it's worth experimenting with water in our gardens or reducing water in our gardens. But you will see um, you get much reduced yield. These farms um, produce only about a third as many tomatoes as <clears throat> I think a uh, farm with that's watered. And um, you do get thick skinned tomatoes, but the flavor is apparently outstanding. Um, I've missed this, this is, oh yeah. Oh, I'm really sorry, this has a, uh, I have sweaty palms that set off my, uh, this wasn't actually my last slide, this is from another <laughs> tomato slide. Oh, I may not be able to get this. Oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, the last picture that's supposed to be in here is a picture that shows a garden that's been planted intensely with uh, tomatoes, just one of many things. Um, uh, sorry about this. I can't seem to find my, uh, well, we'll leave this here. The last picture that I had in the presentation was just a picture of a heavily planted garden that has tomatoes interspersed between edible flowers and squash and pumpkins and beans and artichokes and amaranth. Um, it was just a lovely picture that showed uh, from, well, from a very experienced gardener who has probably sat and watched how things grow. Um, could I encourage everyone to you know, think about changing practices a bit and interplanting, trying new tomatoes and maybe dry gardening too. Uh, thank you. If, you, if there are any questions. Hi Jane, yeah, um, just coming back on here, great. Um, there are quite a few questions. Yeah, if you'd like to stop your share screen, screen sharing your screen, then okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, there are quite a few questions. So we'll just run through them. So um, one of the questions is about pruning. So um, yeah. do you have any tips on pruning indeterminate tomatoes? Um, indeterminate tomatoes grow like a vine. So there's sort of a main stem and then the branches come off. There'll be flowers and a cluster of fruit at the end. The indeterminates produce a sucker where in between where the main stem is and the branch comes off. In old, old tomatoes that are indeterminates, those suckers often got five feet long and we removed them just so the plant could focus on uh, putting energy into producing fruit. Um, it's very easy to remove suckers. You just look where the stem joins, pardon me, the branch effectively with the leaves joins the stem and you cut those out. Okay. Um, mo if you're growing sort of the five to six foot indeterminates like sun gold, I don't take, I don't cut them out. They're not a problem. They produce fruit. The plants produce bushels of fruit. Uh, so you don't need to worry about them in the smaller indeterminates. Okay, great. That's good. Thank you. Um, and then another question about um, uh, when you're doing that sort of no tilling approach and you're just, you know, you're layering some compost or um, manure on the bed, do you, you actually dig it in at all? Mix it in or you just literally lay it on top? Um, it's very popular to talk about no till gardening and people want to do it. I um, the reason people advocate for no-till gardening is because the bacteria that you find in the soil surface is exposed to air and light, um, whereas bacteria that's down deeper gets less light, less air. So the bacteria sort of in different zones in your soil do differ. Oh. And if you till and dig it in, you're putting bacteria on the surface under the soil. Um, in my experience, um, the recommendation, I found the recommendation to not till and just put compost on the surface um, is great in an, 
in a, an established garden. Um, there's uh, the soil underneath is good and loose and the worms come up and it just eventually works in. But if you're just starting a garden, um, often you're putting four inches of compost over sort of poor soil. Um, and I, we garden really uh, intensely, um, much more intensely than farms do. So sort of advocates for no-till in a farming situation are talking about quite something quite different than a really intensely planted home garden. And I think that it's okay to till it in when you're starting a new garden and the soil underneath is poor. You want to start with organic material and your nutrients throughout everything going down, you know, two feet if you can. Okay, great. That's great. Um, so that whole business of the trench planting, I'd never heard about that. That was really interesting. So um, the question about that is when you trench plant, does the stem turn upwards on its own? No, you need to. Um, tomato stems by the time, once your seedlings sort of six inches tall are quite, quite, they're not gonna break, they're quite tough. So you just, it goes along and you tuck it up and you tuck some dirt here and here and- Okay. And Right, so you don't stake it, you just kind of get the earth to kind of hold it up. Oh, uh, you could stake it too, it. sure. Yeah, okay. Often it's probably a good idea to put the stakes in then because then you're not gonna jam it in later through, right through the stem. Yeah. yeah. Um, so someone has asked, how do I get tomatoes in June? Well, um, my husband would say go to Safeway, but um, in truth, um, I get tomatoes, ripe tomatoes, the first week of June. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I was challenged by David Spears to do this, and he taught me how um, to get tomatoes ripe in June. Uh, you need to start transplants early in February, so that your plant, and then plant out in early April. And it's still very cool in April, but, um, if you have a hot spot in your garden, you can put two month old transplants in at the beginning of, beginning of April. I wrap, I just put tomato cages around them and wrap them and um, they're well protected. They're against a wall, they're on concrete. And I get tomatoes at the beginning of June. Um, it's necessary when you put tomatoes out that early to plant a parthenocarpic type. Um, these are tomatoes that don't need pollination. Uh, Sillets is the one I usually grow. Um, it's tomatoes won't, po won't pollinate in cool weather, um, but those tomatoes don't need pollination, so they produce fruit. You'll have fruit the first of June. Wow. Um, the other way to get fruit early at the beginning of June is effectively to use uh, your dining room table like a greenhouse. Um, it's, uh, I start tumbler tomatoes because my grandson loves to put, pick them. I start them in a three gallon pot inside. Uh, I start them at the beginning of February. By the time I put them out in the beginning of June, they already have fruit. They're, they're the small little tomatoes. So they're short season and I, you know, I cheat. I just put them out with fruit on them. Wow. Well, that actually, that someone asked about that, about starting tomato seedlings inside. So you said February? Uh, normally you start tomato seedlings about two months before you put them out. So you start them around, I think most, lots of people start them around April 23rd, then they're ready to go out at the beginning of June. Okay, okay. So when you're starting them inside, do you have grow lights overhead? Um, I do, but lots of people don't. Um, the key to, I mean, the basics or this at its simplest, uh, tomato seeds germinate easily in warm conditions, sort of 70 to 80 degrees. Uh, and then it's best to grow them in bright, but cool conditions like 50 to 70 degrees. Uh, look, um, uh, my friend Julie, she sent me a funny picture of her couch tomatoes. She puts her tomato seedlings along the back of her couch in the sun. And I mean, well, that Matt's tomato, Matt's tomato that we saw, that's hers. Uh, she doesn't put them under grow lights. Um, just keeps them in a warm window and they're healthy, healthy. Um, tomatoes are a bit unusual. 
if you don't have them under grow lights, they will get leggy a bit and they do, they're not as thick stemmed or as healthy as those you grow under grow lights, but you can bury the stem. So even, even though they're a bit leggy and tall, if they have been under grow lights, you can bury that stem anyway and you still will get healthy tomato plants. Okay, wow, that's great. Um, now someone was asked about greenhouses and you, you've never mentioned them, which actually I'm fine with because I think most of us don't have a greenhouse, but um, do you know much about growing tomatoes in greenhouses? I don't. Um, uh, you can grow tomatoes all year um, with greenhouses. Um, and supplementary light. Um, greenhouse growing is actually, I think, very sophisticated. Uh, in general, the challenges are, well, the biggest challenge is moisture control, which relates to disease control. Um, I, I borrowed a good book from the library on it. <laughs> Great, okay, good. Um, now, when someone, we're going to go back to those suckers again on the plant. So this is around about sun golds, right? Which you said was one of your favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of yes. the flavor. You said they had really great flavor. Yeah, so the question is, how do you stake them so they don't end up on the ground? I grow, I only grow tomatoes that are sort of four to six feet. Um, and I just use normal, uh, I just use normal tomato cages. I actually turn them upside down um, because the wider, normally tomato cages are like this, yeah. but turned upside down, the wider circle is down at the base. Um, then you've got three or four pieces of wire sticking up. I cut, I've cut those off and I've bent them in a U and I use them to peg the cage down. Uh, that's a daily a grower's trick, but it works well for tomatoes. I just use tomato cages. Wow, that's great. So um, another question was about um, the type of compost or manure you're using. So um, can you use that city compost? I mean, I don't know if they've got that in West Van, but I know in Vancouver, you can buy compost from the city. Um, and, and the question actually is really, can you just plant your, if you get that compost or some manure, can you plant your tomatoes directly into it? Um, I'm not sure. Um, compost holds moisture very well. Um, it's sort of balanced, moderate nutrients. Um, go on soil professors um, through Washington State University Extension. They discuss soil a lot more. Um, I always thought more would be better, but more in terms of nutrients, whether they're organic or not, bacteria break them down and the extra ones run off into our streams. Um, in the winter, you'll have very soggy soil if you only have compost. Um, Garden professors would say, no, that's the wrong thing to do. The soil is a balance of compost, sand, silt, and clay. Uh, the clay is necessary to help keep nutrients in an ionic state in solution so they can be absorbed. The sand and silt help with drainage. Uh, pure compost, it doesn't drain that well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but our summers are dry, so you could just, you could water as you need. I think it will work. Whether it's ideal, I mean, it, it's it's hard to say. I don't know if uh, Laura Marie is in the group today. She plants in full compost and she has a beautiful, healthy garden. So it's done and it's doable and can work very well, but maybe she could comment on that. So who is that? Who is that? Uh, Laura, Laura Marie Newbert. Oh yeah, Laura, yeah, she did a... Um... I she did a talk for you on permaculture yeah, and she right, talks right. about don't think about she's here unless she's um yeah i don't so, think no i'm sorry i can't talk to just growing in yeah. compost um a good place to look for information on soil will be the woman you're having who's coming to speak on soil because she's i mean arguably the best in north america as a speaker on soil um and the garden professor blogs will talk about compost okay Okay. Um, 
I'm just going to move to the chat because there's a couple more questions in there. So if you can bear the two more questions. Um, so someone is saying, did you say that too much water makes a thick skin? On the oh, top? too little water. Too little water. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting with those um, early girls that were dry. I, I, I don't, I didn't quite understand that because they need water to, to yeah. grow. You know, but but maybe they're just it's a moderate amount, right? As you say, we tend to overwater sometimes and think that we need um, to in. I I haven't I haven't practiced dry gardening with tomatoes. Um because our summers are getting dry, warmer and hotter and drier. Um and new tomato breeders are breeding not only just delicious, flavorable, sort of heirloom flavored tomatoes, but they're also growing them to be, uh, breeding them to be strong, resilient, and to need less water. Uh, some of that's a response to a lot of the tomato breeders are in agriculture areas, especially California, where water is limited. Um, the dry farming is part of uh, the old French permaculture, not French permaculture, French, intensive garden method. So you could read more about if you look up French intensive gardening or horticulture, there'd be information there. Um, the, um, the Dirty Girl Farm is in Santa Cruz. They put their tomatoes in early. Uh, well, it's, and so grow one that can grow when it's a bit cooler, like Early Girl, we grow it up here for that reason. Um, I'm not sure how well it is adapted to um, home gardens because on farms you have acres and acres. So 30% yield, you've still got lots of tomatoes. I, I, I hope to find a balance in using less water because I'm, I'm just conscious of the input that goes into my garden. Um, but in truth, I want more tomatoes. So I don't see myself ever not watering. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think they'd survive because we have really dry summers, relatively speaking. We right? do. Yeah, yeah. So you, um, I mean, you need really deep, fertile, good soil for to sustain a tomato over the summer without watering. I'm not sure it's possible here, but yeah, okay. I'm going to experiment with mulching and see what I can do. Good. Um, can I? I just wanted um ask this one question about states versus tomato cages. So uh, you mentioned using the tomato cage. Do you ever just stake your plants? I don't, but you easily can. And there's people who stake or use ropes to grow, you know, the 10 foot indeterminates. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's probably more suited to the indeterminate types that grow like a vine, but no, staking's great for any tomato. Okay, great. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to do one more question here before we wrap up and it's it's kind of a, a really big picture question which I think is really interesting is about um, sort of genetic engineering in tomatoes and so I guess a lot of people are concerned they don't want to be growing varieties that that have been genetically modified. So, um, what's your rep? Do you know much about that? I mean, you mentioned heirlooms and presumably they're not. Um, none of the home vegetables, vegetables we can buy seed for, transplant for, genetically modified. Um, it's an expensive process and it's, it's limited to industrial agriculture. Um, there, are, there is tomato breeding that's being done using CRISPR to insert genes for both salt tolerance and less water. Uh, it's we believe, or there are many breeders who believe that global warming is real, it's coming, um, and water is going to be a limited resource. Um, if we can farm areas that have sandy soil, uh, it would open up many areas to agriculture. So, you know, I think there is a place for the sort of engineering of tomatoes to be done, but not for home gardens. Um, and in truth, um, Tomato breeding is really still just being done the way it's always been done. These new introductions are a real labor of love. Like green zebra took 12 years of breeding to come to market. 
And what he did was just every year look for plants with qualities and traits he wanted, save the seed, save the seed from seed plants that were the strongest. And that's what dominates uh, tomato breeding today. There are no new genes, there's no GM, there's no CRISPR. It's uh, the new tomatoes we're seeing are, a, they really are a labor of love from these breeders and the breeders make no money at them. They're usually just sort of, they're crazy. And, um, and now they're celebrities, but um, they're wonderful, wonderful stories. If you go read about um, uh, Burke, tie-dye and pink boar came from a California farm. Um, and I think it's called Wild Boar Farms. They're really wonderful stories to breed. Wow. Uh, breed, oh. breed. <laughs> Who knew? It's incredible. I, I'm, it I mean, incredible. I do it's also incredible. grow tomatoes, but uh, I honestly had no idea there were so many varieties. So exciting. Wow. Okay. That's great. Um, thank you so much, Jane. This has been so, so really interesting. I, you, I really appreciate the, all the lovely images that you shared. And uh, one of them that somebody wanted um, to see again was the one where you had the diagram, the indeterminant and the determinant. So I, you don't have to put it up now, but maybe- I can send, the way I can to, send you that if you want to send it out. That would be great. And then I can share it with everybody because so that was really- I'm sorry, I'm technologically fun. challenged, though so I- <laughs> That's okay. Doing, had, even doing PowerPoint knowledge, and that's probably more important. You answered all the questions really well. Thank you so much. And I just Thanks wanted very to much, everyone. thank you for all of your help with all of these programs because um, we have uh, quite an audience for these gardening programs in West Van, and um, I want people to realize that Jane is my big my con consultant to find great speakers. So thank you for that as well as this talk because it, it's been it's wonderful. Really thank you very much. Um, of the I'm delighted to be able to be involved with it. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of the weekend. It's going to be absolutely stunning, but don't put out your tomatoes yet unless you've got a nice cover because it's cold. Hmm. All right, great. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.